It was summer, and that meant freedom. I was no longer confined to the chains of school. My mom was going to get her master's degree, and my father worked a full-time job, which meant my parents hired a babysitter to watch my sister and I. Now, my sister is two and a half years older than me and just an evil woman, and I, I mean, I am, you know, I'm, I'm not perfect, but I'm an angel in, uh, in, every, in every sense, and so... I would be persecuted by my older sister who would pick on me, and this was right around the age where I could finally start to beat her up, but when she used to pummel me as a kid, that was fine, and as soon as I could turn the tables, we don't hit women, Brian, so she just beat the snot out of me for years, and then I was never allowed to retaliate. Well, we had a babysitter who couldn't control us, and so the morning started with fisticuffs, and then we, we, uh, we decided that was boring and that was kind of dumb. And so then we just, we just wrecked the place. We played with toys. We wouldn't, li- we wouldn't listen. We, had, we made a mess, just an absolute mess of the place. And the babysitter's like, well, you should, you should clean up. You should mind your own business, Becky. We're doing what we want today. How about that? And so we just didn't listen to her at all, and it was just a situation where she clearly couldn't control us. Like, she was trying to call my dad at work. It was, the, it was one of those situations, and I was like, oh, that's really going to strike the fear of God into me. You're going to call my dad. Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo. And then I heard the garage door open. <laughs> and then my dad walked in. And I, I'll never forget him looking around and then making eye contact with us. New sheriff was in town. (laughs) Dad had returned. And with him, he brought some order. And he looked around at the situation. He just said, we're not going to conduct ourselves like this. We're not going to do this. And I thought I was going to be grounded for like a month. But he just really calmly said, fix it and do better. This morning, we're starting something called Correction. And basically, this is a look back at a a book in the Bible in the New Testament called 1 Corinthians, because it was written to a church in Corinth. That's where the name comes from, Corinthians. And it's written by a guy who at one point pastored the church. His name was Paul. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And he's basically telling the people in Corinth to do better. See, they were divided, and they fought amongst themselves. They lived to excess, and they celebrated that fact. They partied and pursued whatever passions overcame them. They were promiscuous and celebrated their indulgent sexuality. Their lives were a mess. And their reputations and reports of their conduct were well known. And they became alarming, causing concern for Paul, their former pastor. And he took the time to reach out to them and to, and to talk with them, and he directed them to understand the amazing love that God has for them. And so you might be here today, and this might be the start of a new year, and you're like, I want to start fresh, I, w- I want to start new, and your life right now is a mess, and I just want to encourage you, God loves you. God loves you in your mess. And, and for the love of God, we don't want you to stay that way, but understand you're never too far gone for God to love you and do something awesome in your story. So whether you look at your life right now and you're like, I can't believe some of the mistakes I've made, you need to be encouraged because I promise you, I promise you, as we walk through this book of 1 Corinthians and as we go through this series, Correction, your life can't be as bad as some of these examples. And what we see time and again is that God and his incredible love still desires a relationship with you, that he loves you and you're never too far gone for him. And so we're going to be looking over the course of the next, next few weeks at the, at the book of 1 Corinthians, and what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at a lot of the practical implications of, of how it applies to our lives, and so we're not going to go over every single verse of every chapter, but we'd encourage you throughout the week on the Bible apps, on your phones or your tablets, to take a look at the, ber- the, at the book of 1 Corinthians and to read along with us. But this morning we're going to start in chapter 1 and verse 10. You can follow along in the Bible apps on your phones or your tablets, or you can follow along on the screens as we read these words. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind 
and the same judgment. So what he's saying is be on the same page. Be on the same page. The church works best when everyone's on the same page. This is, this is true universally. The family works best when everyone's on the same page. Your work environment works best when everyone's on the same page. Have you ever had that coworker that's incredibly talented but nobody likes? And nobody wants to work with that person? And if you're a boss, you have a real dilemma. Because here's somebody who's incredibly talented, incredibly gifted at everything they do, and yet nobody wants to be around them. And so they're killing morale, and you've got to get to the point where you have to make a decision. What, what ways can I restructure either to keep this person isolated so that we can continue to get the great results, or at what point do I have to cut them loose even though they're incredibly gifted because of what they're doing for morale of everybody else on the team? We see this all the time in the world of sports, that just because somebody has the most talent doesn't mean their team is going to be the most successful because there's a chemistry factor. That's true in every area of life, and it's true in the church as well. And so Paul's telling the people of Corinth, for the people in the church, be on the same page. Be united. Yeah, you're different people, and as a result of being different people, you're going to have different political ideologies. You're going to have different ways that you look at issues. You're going to feel different things because God's created all of us uniquely, and that's great. But, it, but we need to come together. And so he says, bring all of that together, but be united and be on the same page. And then he continues and he says this, For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. And so what he says is, Chloe's people have been snitches, and they've told me that you guys are all fighting. That you're all fighting. All right? They told me that some of you are like, hey, I follow Paul, others I follow Apollos, I, I follow Cephas, others I follow Christ. There's only one category that gets it right. It's the category, I follow Christ. And here at Lakeside, if you're new to Lakeside, welcome. I want to tell you, you're, you're coming in at a really exciting time in the life and the history of Lakeside, and we're so glad that you're here. Thanks for spending part of your Sunday morning with us. But in just a few weeks, we're expanding our staff uh, yet again, and we, we are bringing in a, a worship arts pastor by the name of Derek. And as you know, a few weeks or a few months ago now, we brought Baxter as the family life pastor onto the team. And so it's just natural that as people of Lakeside, some of you are going to feel a connection to me. Some of you are going to feel a connection to Derek. Some of you are going to feel a connection to Baxter. Well, maybe Liz. Okay, we'll feel a connection to Baxter. But <laughs> it's a joke, everybody. It's a joke. It's a joke. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. It's not about that. At no point, at, at no point are we trying to build factions and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm all about Brian or I'm all about Baxter or I'm all about Derek. No, if, if that's the point, then we've led really poorly and you've missed the point. The point is not me. The point is not Baxter. The point is not Derek. The point is Jesus. That's what it's all about. And so we, we don't, yeah, we want you to love us. Yeah, we want you to like, and that's perfectly fine if you're like, yeah, I don't like Brian, but I'm all about Baxter, I'm all about Derek, that's great. I still love you, that's awesome. But what we want is we want people to look and we want people to follow Jesus. It's not about us. It's just not. And so one of the, one of the, just the most exciting examples that I've seen about this in the last year, it was a year ago uh, now that, that we went and we talked to John in my office right after Sunday morning. And I didn't know how that conversation was going to go. I said, John, we just want to give you a heads up. We're going to start the process of looking for a full-time worship arts pastor. And John's like, great. I'm like, what? You know, I'm thinking like musicians, egos, you know, not, no offense to any of you musicians, but your basket cases sometimes. And, you know, everybody, art, artists can, can be a little, you know, out there. Uh, and, and, and that's fine. And I'm like, I don't know how, I don't know how John's going to take this. I, I don't know how. And let me tell you something. For the last year, I've watched that man week in and week out serve the Lord with passion and energy and enthusiasm and excitement. And there were people along the way that we talked to, candidates, who would ask the question, well, is he still going to be involved in the music? And I said, I absolutely hope so, because I could think of no better resource to you than to have John involved. And we have seen it 
We have seen it on display for the last year, week in and week out. And it has just been an incredible display of somebody using the gifts that God has given them and just not wanting to point people to themselves, but to elevate the cause of Jesus. And for that, we are all thankful. Thank you very much, John. And then he continues, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone and anyone else and so we get the legal disclaimer at the end of the rant right there do you notice that he's like i'm glad i didn't baptize any of you okay i baptized stephanus and i'm not sure if i baptized any of it but but we're gonna it's just i mean that's a good rant you, you ever just been there maybe as a parent you're just on a roll and you're just cutting a monologue on your kids that would go down in the record books and then you're like well okay you don't always do that once or twice but you get the point that's what paul's doing right here and he's just saying, I'm so glad. And, and he says, look at this. Look at this. Don't follow me. Don't follow me. Follow Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Was I crucified for you? Could I pay the price for your sins and your shortcomings? No. Were you baptized into my name? No. That's, it's not about that. He says, here's the point. And then he continues in verse 17 when he says this. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. And so Paul says here, Christ sent me to preach. Christ sent me to preach. That's, that's what he sent me to do. He sent me to preach. Here's the reality. God has given us all different and unique gifts. God's given us all different and unique gifts. And no one gift is better than any other gift. And in fact, later on in this letter to the church in Corinth, he would go through this in painstaking detail that no one gift is, is better than other gifts, but that we need all the gifts to operate within unity. And so here's the deal. God has equipped you with special gifts, talents, and abilities that you have. And you should celebrate that fact. And you should operate accordingly. That you should operate within those gifts. But you should never believe the lie that there's nothing that you can do to contribute to God's purpose or God's people. God has, God has wired all of us with unique passions and abilities and talents. And so whatever God has wired you with, you need to be actively using for his glory. And that looks different for, for people. Some, as we've already talked, some people are musicians. And that's great. You should use that gift to the glory of God. Some of you love little kids. God bless you. I don't get it, right? I, I just, whatever. That's awesome. I'm, I'm so thankful for you because I'm the freak that likes them more when they're in middle school and high school. And you're like, get them away from me, please. Like, I have to keep them in my house by law. But that's the only reason they're sticking around during puberty because I don't want anything. And I'm like, oh, this is kind of entertaining. This is kind of fun. Yeah, absolutely. And, and other people look at that and you're like, what is wrong with you? Some of you are, are incredibly incredibly artistic and you just have an eye for things and you can you can just look at something and you can see a space and turn it into something that's just completely different and it's just it's incredible what you can do some of you can can manage things really well and you can look at a situation and you can you can go in and look at a restructuring and you can say well this is what you would need to do in order to maximize profitability and here's how you need to change the the structure of the team, and, and it's just great. Here's the deal. There are many diverse ways that God has gifted us and God has blessed us and God has equipped us. And the point is this, that we need to use those gifts to the glory of God, that we need to be, we need to be in, invested and involved in his, in his purpose. 
Christ sent me to preach, Paul says, but he didn't send everybody to preach, and that's perfectly okay. But God has given you gifts, so you need to use them. And we aren't restricted to operating in our own ability. That's what's so incredible about this. Yes, God has given us gifts, but check this out. We aren't dependent upon ourselves. We aren't dependent upon ourselves, but it is within the power of God that he takes those gifts and abilities and uses them on an even greater level than what we can fathom. And don't miss this. The incredible power of God to use simple, ordinary people for his glory. Let me read these verses again and let them really sink in. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. God uses the ordinary people for his glory. God uses simple, ordinary people to further his work. And then he continues. Where is the one who's wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of the sage? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. God advances his cause through regular people. Never mistake this. Never think you aren't qualified enough. Never think that you, you haven't figured it all out yet. Never think that you just need to do one more thing or one more thing to prove that you're ready. No, no, no. God uses ordinary, simple people for his glory. And so never find yourself paralyzed by the lie that you're just not ready. Because it's never been about you anyway. It's all about the glory of God being on display in you, through you, and oftentimes in spite of you for his purpose. This is what it's all about. And a lot of the elites of this world that, that people look to and admire for their wisdom and their intellect and their knowledge, they look down upon the people that God uses to accomplish his work. Now, that's not universally true. But more often than not, the elites of this world that people would look to and say, look at their brilliance, look at their understanding, look at how, how vast the, the areas of their knowledge, more often than not, the intellectual elites of the day are not the people that God advances his kingdom through. He continues, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Understand this, the message of Jesus makes no sense to those who don't believe. The message of Jesus makes no sense to those who don't believe. And so never find yourself upset because people that you love and you care about just do not understand why you follow Jesus. Because the message of the cross is foolishness to those who have not had an encounter with Jesus. And so if you are looking for something to... to just talk about that's going to be universally understood, Christianity is certainly not it. There are going to be people who look at you and just do not understand you. They do not understand why you love Jesus. They do not understand why you conduct your life in the way that you do. And this is why it's so important that you understand that your, your significance need not come from the perception that other people have about you. If your significance comes in what everybody else says and feels and thinks about you, you're never going to find fulfillment and joy in that place. Because people will look at you and they will not understand, they will not fathom 
why it is you follow Jesus. And the question that those of us who follow Jesus must answer is, what is our response to that? Do we allow the fact that others don't understand us to discourage us? Do we become shrinking violets and not want to offend anybody with the message of love and hope that we have on display from a result of following Jesus? And so we just kind of shrink back and don't talk about it with anybody? Do we understand that it's all right that not everybody's going to understand why it is that we follow Jesus, but just do our best to model his love and share the hope that we have with anyone that we encounter anyways? This gets especially hard when it hits home. Especially when it's a spouse or a significant other. Someone that you're really invested with and you really love. And yet for the life of you, you just can't understand why they can't see it. And you'd give anything for them too. But it's just a source of frustration. You wonder, am I doing something wrong? Am I not clear enough? No, it's not on you at all. It's just the message of Jesus' foolishness to those who don't believe. This is why I want to encourage for those of you who are dating somebody right now, it's so important, it's so important to have the the faith conversation early on in the relationship and just make sure that you're unified in in that because you're going, if, if you're not, you're going to face problems in the days to come. I promise you that. Your relationship is going to be more difficult. And so this is one of the things that you really need to be united on. You want to be united in terms of your faith. You want to be united in terms of your philosophy on money. You want to be united in terms of how often you need to see your mother-in-law. You need to be in line. You need to be united on all those things. Because she might be like, let's FaceTime every night. And you'd be like, let's FaceTime once every decade. And we're good, right? And if, if you don't come to terms with that, there's going to be some friction along the way. But never beat yourself up because somebody doesn't understand why it is you love and follow Jesus. Don't get depressed when people who don't believe in Jesus don't understand you. And understand this, that the foolishness of God is wiser than the most wisdom that we as humans can come up with. And the weakness of God is greater than all of our collective strength. That is the wisdom and the power of God on display. That God is so much greater than us, we can't even fully fathom it. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And then he says this, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. If you have anything to be proud of, if you have anything to brag about, if you have anything to boast about, boast about this, that your creator loves you and he has redeemed you and he has made a way to have a restored relationship with you. If you're feeling yourself about anything, feel that, that God loves you. He just says, most of you, come on, we know your ACT scores, right? (laughs) We saw the SAT return. We, we know what's going on. Most of, you, you're not. Most of you aren't exactly setting the world record for how much you can bench press, right? Most of you, you're not exactly the, on the who's who list of everything else. But here's the deal. Your significance doesn't need to be found in your intellect. 
Your significance doesn't need to be found in what you can physically accomplish. Your significance doesn't need to be found in what you achieve in your career. And how many cases do we have to see of people who strive to find their significance in their intellect or in their physical appearance or what they can do with their bodies or in what they achieve? How many cases do we have to see where people who accomplish it all are entirely empty? And after they've accomplished it all, say, what now? This didn't leave me feeling like I thought it would leave me feeling. There has to be something more. And the answer is, there is something more. Now, now some have to learn that the hard way. And some of you right now, you're, you're on the precipice. You are on the verge of accomplishment like you have like you couldn't even fathom a few years. Like you are just right on the verge. You're about to just, it's about to take off. You are about to experience success like you cannot even fathom. And you hear this right now, and you're like, it's gonna be a little different for me. It's gonna be a little different for me. I hear what you're saying about about finding my significance and finding my worth and finding all this in Jesus, but it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to look, it's going to feel a little different when I conquer this milestone, when I climb this mountain. And I promise you this, if your hope is in what you can achieve, if your hope is in success, you will be left feeling empty. Make sure, make sure that your hope and your significance is found in your relationship with your creator who loves you in spite of the mess that you've made in your life, in spite of the ways that you've turned your back on him. Find your significance and find your success. If there's anything for you to boast about, if there's anything for you to brag about, make it this, that you're a follower of Jesus. And the reason, the reason I say that is because I want you to avoid the heartache and the hardship that will come if you choose not to. We've seen all the examples. And it's always the same. The money doesn't fill the void. The sexual relationships don't fill the void. The new house, the new car, it doesn't fill the void. Fame feels empty. There has to be more is the constant refrain of people who experience the most success that this world has to offer. And the answer is, there is more. And it's Jesus. So what are the practical implications for us? Well, first, this. Like I said, let's let's celebrate the fact that God chooses us. Let's just celebrate the fact that God chooses us, right? Like... I don't know what your ACT scores. I could, I could guess for some of you, all right? Some of you could guess for me, right? Like, I'm not setting any percentiles on fire up here. But let's just, celebrate, let's just celebrate the fact that God chooses ordinary, regular people to accomplish things that are greater than us for his glory. Like, God doesn't need us, but he chooses to utilize us for his purpose. And that is an incredible privilege. And so understand that God has given us talents, gifts, and abilities And let's celebrate the fact that we have those and we can use those to further his glory and to further his cause. So that's that's what's really exciting. And let's celebrate that fact. Let's just right now celebrate that fact that God chooses to use us. That we don't have a distant God who's, who's divorced from our lives and divorced from our realities, but we serve a God who loves us and is concerned about us and cares about us personally. Let's make it a point. Let's make it a point to take this message to people that we know. 
understanding not everybody's going to understand. But let's make it a point to take this message, the message of hope, the message of restoration, the message of reconciliation, the message that there is more to the emptiness that all of this world has to offer, and let's take that message to people that we know. And not in obnoxious ways, not in ways where we look at them and say, well, here's everything that you're doing wrong in your life, and let me tell you, all these areas you need to correct as well. No, no, no. But let's instead conduct our lives so that when people look at us, they ask, what's different about you? What's different about you? Why do you have peace? Why do you have joy? How can you operate this way? And so let's just live with Jesus on full display within us. And it doesn't mean that we're going to be perfect because we're all going to fall short of that. But let's just make sure that this is an integral part of our our stories. That we're a community here. And so make make it a tangible thing to invite people to come join you here at Lakeside. To reach out to your neighbors and your coworkers and your family, especially when you find people are going through a really hard time and say, hey, listen, come check this out. Give me an hour. Give me an hour. And you may hate it, and if if you do, that's fine. I'll never ask you again. But give me an hour and come see if you're not encouraged and come see if God doesn't do something within your heart in that hour on Sunday. And make it, make it a tangible goal to invite somebody who's going through a rough time to join you and see how God uses a community and see how God uses a time where we just pause and reflect on his greatness and his goodness and see what God does in their life. So make that a point. That's, that's a really easy invite. Just say, hey, join me. And I'll make it a point. I'll sit with you. I'll save you a seat. So, and, and if you want, I'll walk in with you so you don't feel like, hey, all these people I don't know are, are trying to accost me or anything else. What do they want? They, they just love you, that's all. They just, want, they just want to welcome you, but you make it a point. Say, I'll walk in with you. I'll sit with you. I'll show you where to drop off your kids. It's great. They're going to have more fun down there than they will with you anyways, and you're not going to have to yell at them for an hour, so it's a win-win. But just make it a point. Make it a point to invite somebody. Let's make it a point to further this message of hope by being invested and being involved and using the gifts, whatever gifts we have, but using the gifts that God has given us within this community for his glory. That however God has equipped us, we just say we're going to come together and we're going to use what we have for the hope and the message of Jesus. And if you're here and you haven't made the decision to follow Jesus, or maybe you have, maybe you have made the decision to follow Jesus, and your life right now is a wreck, honestly, and you look and there's a lot of regret and a lot of choices you wish you could make differently or that you wouldn't have made, I just want to encourage you with this. God's not done with your story. And God loves you. Now, he wants you to change. He wants you to become more like him. But God hasn't given up on you. Don't you give up on God. He wants to do something incredible in your life. The question is, will you let him? The message of the cross is foolishness to those who don't believe. But the weakness of God is greater than the strength of this world. And the foolishness of God is greater than our best wisdom. God, I pray that we would be a community of people who are united around the fact that you are what matters. I pray we'd be a collection of people who use the gifts and abilities that we have to serve you. I pray we'd be a place where people who are going through a hard time could find encouragement and enlightenment, that they could experience love. God, not that it's about Lakeside or us, but that we would point them to the hope that is only found through a relationship with you. God, I pray for the person right now who really is on the precipice of amazing success. And I pray that you'd give them the perspective that they need. That you would help them see that apart from you, no matter what they accomplish, will ultimately leave them feeling empty. That there is a greater purpose. 
God, I pray that you would bless this place. I pray, God, that we would have the, just have the opportunity to encounter more people who need the hope of a relationship with Jesus, and we would point them to you, God, and we would see lives change. We would see people make the decision to follow you. We would see them understand the foolishness of the message of the cross and understand the, the grace and the goodness of you, how you love us. you would just make that all click in their minds. And God, we thank you for letting us play a part in that. So we're asking you now to blow our minds in what you accomplished through us. So we have to look and say, yeah, it wasn't us. It's just God at work through us. And God is greater. That's our hope, and that's our prayer. We ask in your son, Jesus' name we pray, amen.